Okay, I think we can start. So um, we are very happy to have here Gerald Schwartz that will tell us when does the zero fiber of a moment, the moment map have rational singularities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak in Israel again after six years, although I don't get to be physically present. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with uh, Hans Christian Herbig and Christopher Seaton. And uh, this is about uh, a work that we posted to the archive about uh, two months ago, and that's the, uh, the number at the archive uh, for the paper. Uh, our joint work is kind of a, a child of the pandemic. We got together uh, to work on this problem, the problems I'm gonna talk about in uh, January of 2020. And uh, we were able to uh, get together in, uh, in France and, and Switzerland uh, for a few weeks to uh, work on these problems intensively. And then of course, after that, uh, nobody was meeting anybody uh, for a while. So uh, first I'm going to talk about representation varieties, and then uh, I'm going to talk about their uh, connection uh, to um, the uh, moment mappings. So uh, the basic object is a semi-simple complex Lie group G. And uh, I wanted to find this group gamma, gamma P which is the uh, quotient of the free group on, gener on uh, 2P generators, A1, B1, et cetera, through A sub P, B sub P, uh, by the normal subgroup generated by the product of the commutators, A1, B1, A2, B2, up through AP, BP. So uh, this is better known as the fundamental group of a compact Riemann surface of genus P. Um, but actually, uh, it has some connection to uh, uh, moment mappings, as, as we'll see. So anytime you're given a group, uh, usually a discrete group like gamma P, you can define the representation variety, which is all the homomorphisms from the discrete group gamma P into our complex Lie group G, uh, which is called the representation variety. And this is uh, a lot of people study these representation varieties and, uh, and um, their properties. So this uh, representation variety actually has a scheme structure as the inverse image of a point by a morphism uh, capital Phi from the 2p power of g into g, which sends a 2p tuple g1h1 up through gphp to the product of the commutators. So home ga gamma pg is just the inverse image of the identity in g by this homomorphism. Um, what's interesting is this uh, homomorphism is g equivariant where the elements in the group um, act on the target G by conjugation and on the source G to the 2P by conjugation on each component. And you can see that um, with this action of G phi is G equivariant, hence G acts on the inverse image of the identity, which is uh, the representation variety home gamma PG. Now, there's a connection between growth sequences of topological groups and this representation variety due to the work of Eisenbud and Avni. So let gamma be a topological group and Rn of gamma, the number of n-dimensional, irreducible, continuous, complex representations of gamma. 
so the so-called growth sequence of gamma. So Eisenbud and Avni in a paper in Invenciones in 2016 proved many connections between uh, the properties of the representation variety and various properties of groups, in, including growth sequences. So I'm gonna state in a somewhat convoluted form, one, one, just one of the theorems in, in, their, in their paper. So let K be a finitely generated field of characteristic zero, for example, it could just be the rationals, over which our uh, complex group G is, G is defined. Of course, G is an algebraic group. Reductive groups are algebraic. So it's, they're all defined over some uh, extension of, of finite extension of Q actually. So what they proved is the following is equivalent. Now, first of all, you can consider there's a special point in the uh, representation variety, which of course is the trivial representation, which sends everything to the identity of G. And you can consider the tangent cone at that point. And you can ask whether the tangent cone has rational singularities. Or you can ask, does the whole, does the whole uh, representation variety have rational singularities? Or you can ask a third question, which seems to have nothing to do with the first two, which is the following condition. For every non-Archimedean local field F containing K and compact open subgroup gamma contained in the F points of G, you can consider the growth sequence of gamma and you can ask whether the growth sequence of gamma it grows uh, slower than n to the 2p minus 3. So it, it, the slower than n to the 2p minus 3 is because there's a minus epsilon for some epsilon greater than 0. So Eisenbud, Eisenbud and Avni show that these are equivalent. So this property of the tangent cone proves very interesting uh, uh, number theoretic results about these uh, uh, subgroups of uh, points of F in uh, local non-Archimedean local fields. Uh, just a small remark, we formally speaking, we proved that R1 implies R2 and R3 and did yes. not prove the inverse direction. So a posteriori, since you proved R1, now it's not, now the R equivalent, but. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misread. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now they're all equivalent. Okay. Um, and of course, the question is, well, what is the speed? How fast do, 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 does this number Rn of gamma increase? And of course, it might be interesting if it's uh, true for small p. So you want these results for the smallest uh, possible P. So uh, Eisenbud and Avni observed in a later paper that uh, various results put together show that R1 is true for P greater than or equal to 21, I think. And our interest in working on this project is because one of us saw a paper by Nero Buder, which has appeared in international Mathematics Research Notes, 2019. Although I don't think it's appeared in print, but it's, uh, it's um, online, accepted for publication. And, it's, and uh, his result is, if the symbol factors of G are of type A, so all, it's all if it's a product of SLNs, then R1 holds for P greater than or equal to two. So it says that the growth sequence of any gamma is uh, slower than n. So it, it doesn't grow any faster than n. This is stated, some people state this in terms of the so-called abscissa of convergence of another series and, it, and it, it's equal to the statement that the abscissa of convergence is less than two. 
but it's easier since I don't want to define what the abscess of convergence is. It's easier to say it in terms of just Rn of a gamma. Okay. So we have shown R1 for P greater than or equal to two in all complex semi-simple G. So that's the, our main contribution. And uh, we prove this by um, restating the condition R1 that the tangent cone of the um, representation variety has rational singularities in terms of moment maps. So, so G is still our complex reductive group and V is a G module. So if, uh, for much just a finite dimensional um, uh, algebraic representation of G. So, uh, and then what we do is we double it. So we take V plus V star. And of course, since there's a natural G invariant contraction of V star and V on V plus V star, you can put a standard symplectic form V uh, such that V and V star are Lagrangian subspaces, meaning that they are, uh, that the symplectic form vanishes identically on V and V of course has half the dimension of the uh, space U. And then there's a standard moment mapping mu from V plus V star to uh, the dual of the Lie algebra, G star, which has uh, the following simple formula. If you have a, a vector V and V and a vector V star and V star, then of course you should have mu of V of V star should be an element in the dual of the Lie algebra. So if you apply it to an element A in G, the formula is it's just V star <clears throat> A of V. So that's our standard moment mapping. And of course, uh, moment mappings, when you have a symplectic uh, manifold with a G action, they're not unique, but they're almost unique. And in this case, mu is the unique moment mapping which sends the origin to the origin. Okay, so the thing that we're most interested in is the inverse image of zero, which we call the shell, and we denote by N. So since mu is a, easy to see, is a G equivariant mapping, um, where of course the group acts on its Lie algebra in the usual way on V and V star in the given way, so since mu is G equivariant, the inverse image of the fixed point zero has a G action. So the connection between this uh, shell business, the inverse image of uh, zero under the moment mapping is because if V is the direct sum of P copies of the Lie algebra of G, then the tangent cone to the representation variety above is isomorphic to the shell N. And this just happens to be true because this group gamma P is in terms of this product of commutators. And of course, commutators, when you take the derivative is just Lie bracket in the Lie algebra. So the main question for us is for which V does N have rational singularities? And of course, the question that I posed at the beginning is, for the particular V, which is the direct sum of P copies of the Lie algebra, does N have rational singularities in that case, which would make the, uh, the theorem of uh, Eisenbud and Avni work for P equals any P greater than or equal to two. Okay. Now, it turns out that since we're studying N, which lives inside V plus V star, it may be that it's not 
the properties of V that are important, but uh, I mean, you can change V. So let V prime be a G submodule of U, which you remember is V plus V star, which is Lagrangian, so half the dimension and uh, iso uh, isotropic. And then of course, then you have V prime, then you have its corresponding shell N prime. But when you do this construction, nothing changes. The N you get, the N prime you get is, isomor is G isomorphic to the N you started with. So if you start with a V, you can change to a different uh, G module V prime, and you have the same shell. Now we're going to play this game throughout this paper. And now um, here's an important invariant, which uh, is associated to um, any G module V. So we uh, define Vn to be the set of all points in V, such as dimension of the isotropy group is N. So G sub X just means the elements in G which fix X and has a dimension. And then we say V is K modular for any integer K greater than or equal to zero if the co-dimension of this Vn is at least N plus K for all N bigger than or equal to one. So what it's saying is that the point that um, there's an open dense set of points where the isotropy groups of finite are finite, and the uh, points which have positive dimensional isotropy group are in rather high co-dimension. So if the isotropy group has dimension n, then the co-dimension is n plus k. So not every G module has this property, but uh, we'll see why this property is very important for what we're studying. Now it's a result of Panyushev that uh, the fact that V is K modular holds if and only if certain cohomological conditions hold for the algebra of functions on N. So what this means is in particular, if we play this game above of changing from V to some V prime, some other Lagrangian G sub module of V plus V star, it's not gonna change that it's K modular. Any other choice will also be K modular. So it's an invariant uh, of the Lagrangian subspaces of V plus V star. So what are some of these cohomological conditions? So there's a theorem, which is um, the following. So let's assume that V is zero modular. So what is V is zero modular? That's actually equivalent to the first statement here, that N is a complete intersection. So N is a complete intersection if and only if V is zero modular. And then of course, if it's a complete intersection, since it's a mapping into a G dimensional space, the dimension of N is two dim V minus dim G. So let's assume anyway that that uh, one always holds, that N is a complete intersection or equivalent that V is zero modular. That By N is complete a... intersection, you mean complete intersection inside V, not, not up, inside V times V star, not, not abstract. Yeah. Yes, 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 it's, yes. So it's, it's given inside V plus V star by exactly dim G equations and its dimension is uh, cut down by dim G. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the next statement is that N is a variety, so reduced and irreducible, if and only if V is one modular. So it's another example of Panyushev's uh, type results. And the third result is that N is factorial, which I take to mean that the algebra of functions is a unique factorization domain, um, if and only if V is two modular. It's interesting, there isn't a easy if and only if condition uh, involving modularity and such for N to be um, a normal variety, but factorial has this uh, very geometric condition on, on V. And now here's a general theorem 
uh, we were able to prove, which uh, I won't talk about the techniques, although they're somewhat related to ones I'll talk about later, which says that um, N almost always has rational singularities. I mean, if you pick a G module V at random, the corresponding shell will have rational singularities. The, the precise statement is the following. Suppose that V is dim G modular. So the modularity is at least the dimension of G. Then N has rational singularities. The second statement says that this is almost always true. So let K be greater than or equal to zero and let G be semi-simple. Consider G modules V where to get rid of trivial problems, I'll assume that uh, uh, the set of G fixed points is, zero, is just the origin. But we assume that uh, for these G modules, all irreducible submodules are almost faithful representations of the group. In other words, for any G submodule of V, there's no uh, normal factor of G which acts trivially. So for example, if the group is simple, then this is the empty condition, of course, since there's only one factor. Well, then up to isomorphism, there are only finitely many V which are not K modular. In particular, there are only finitely many V which are not dim G modular. Now, so in general, there's nothing to worry about, but of course, we're interested in some particular cases and uh, this theorem is not best possible. There are certain classes of modules for which N has rational singularities uh, when V is only one modular. And of course, V being one modular is what you need just to make N a variety. So it's sort of the, the weakest uh, condition you could possibly want. So this theorem is not the best possible, but it shows that in general, you have rational singularities. Okay, um, to talk about some other conditions, I have to remind you of some things in uh, invariant theory. So a couple definitions. So let X be an affine G variety. Then there's a categorical quotient with a quotient mapping pi X from X to X double slash G because it's not really the orbit space. It's really the space of closed orbits. But X double slash G is really the uh, complex affine variety corresponding to the G invariant functions on X. And it's uh, essentially due to Hilbert that uh, CX upper G is finitely generated. So this is actually a, a, a usual uh, affine variety. So, and of course the mapping pi X is just dual to the inclusion of finitely generated rings of CX upper G inside CX. Now, what isn't obvious is that pi is onto and each fiber of pi contains a unique closed G orbit. So this quotient variety X double slash G really parameterizes the closed G orbits. Now it's a theorem of Luna, Domingo Luna, the guy who invented the Luna slice theorem, that there's always a principal isotropy group H such that the set of fibers of pi X whose closed orbit orbits are G isomorphic to G mod H is an open and dense subset X PR, X principle of X. Of course, there isn't a principal isotropy group because it's only really well defined up to conjugation. I mean, you can replace H by a conjugate and then the statement is still the same. So we say that X has FPIG or finite principal isotropy groups if H is finite. If H is finite, then this set XPR consists of closed orbits. So when X has FPIG, there's a big dense open set XPR such that the orbits are closed with finite isotropy 
And the quotient there is really geometric. You're just taking the space of orbits because they're all closed, so they all survive under the quotient mapping. So finally, here's our definition of what we're going to try to prove. We say that N, the, the uh, shell, the inverse image of zero under the moment mapping is good if N has <clears throat> FPIG and has rational singularities. Okay. And then finally, um, again, we're going to give a definition that has to do with changing the Lagrangian subspace of V plus V star. So we say that a G module V has property P up to changing Lagrangian subvariety of V plus V star. Mm -hmm. If there is a Lagrangian G submodule of V plus V star with property P. So here is our official definition of playing the game of changing Lagrangian subspace. Now, uh, my co-authors and I wrote a paper in 2020 where we weren't worried about N, but we were worried about the quotient of the categorical quotient of N. And we were worried about showing that it had symplectic singularities. And to show that it had symplectic singularities, we sometimes had to prove that N had rational singularities. So we proved the following theorem. Let G be a torus and V a G module. If V has finite principal isotropy groups up to changing Lagrangian subspace of V plus V star, then N is good. So it has finite principal isotropy groups and rational singularities. Then that's halfway to the goal line. Then by a theorem of Bouteau, the quotient N double slash G has rational singularities and you're almost to the goal line of proving that uh, the quotient has symplectic singularities. So let me give a Mickey Mouse example of this. So let V be the two-dimensional C star module with weights one and minus one. So it's just the, the scalar action of C star on C2. So the only closed orbit is zero. So it doesn't have finite principal isotropy groups, but it is one modular. But now we're gonna make a change. So V plus V star, which of course has two weights of plus one and two weights of minus one, has a Lagrangian submodule V prime with weights one and minus one. So V prime, if you look at the C star module with weights one and minus one, well, the generic, the general orbit is closed with trivial stabilizer. So it certainly has finite principal isotropy groups, hence by the theorem above, N is good. And then I want to sneak in another definition. Uh, v prime is orthogonal, i.e. admits a non-degenerate symmetric G invariant bilinear form. So this property of uh, a G module become very uh, important later. Okay. Now, if we want to prove that N has rational singularities, it would be good if we could, uh, I mean, this is just a, a local statement, right? I mean, you, you take a point X and N and you can say that N has rational singularities at X. So what we really want to do is to take a closed orbit in N, uh, preferably not the origin, and look at the structure of the um, shell transversal to the closed orbit. So somehow we're thinking of the uh, shell as being uh, the closed orbit G sub X cross a normal piece. So we have to figure out what this normal piece is and it will turn out that the normal piece is again a shell, but of a so-called 
symplectic slice representation. Okay, so if we have a closed orbit, the isotropy group is reductive. And then I defined E to be the tangent space at X to the orbit. But of course, G sub X is isomorphic to G mod H. So E looks like the Lie algebra of G divided by the Lie algebra of H is completely determined by H, in fact. Then you show the following. Uh, first of all, it's well known that E is isotropic. So you can write V plus V star as a direct sum of E plus E star, where E and E star are isotropic. And S, of course, then uh, the form will be non-degenerate on S. So sigma, our symplectic form on V plus V star, induces a symplectic H invariant form, sigma S on S. We have again a symplectic representation and we call S with the action of H, the symplectic slice representation at X. This is the thing that's gonna give us the normal piece to N. So S admits, you have to prove, an H stable Lagrangian submodule W. And if you look at sigma S on W plus W star, which is isomorphic to S, then it becomes standards, the standard one such that W and W star are, is are isotropic, are Lagrangian. So then we have a moment mapping S to H star with shell that we call N sub S. And then um, we have the symplectic slice theorem of our earlier paper with uh, um, Herbig and Seton which says the following, let P be one of the following conditions, reduced, smooth, normal, or rational singularities. Then N satisfies property P at X, if and only if N sub S satisfies condition P at zero. The real statement, I don't wanna state the symplectic slice theorem because it takes a lot of notation and so on, but what it basically says is, the closed orbit we're talking about is, is G, the group, divided by H. But near X, N looks like the fiber bundle over G mod H with fiber N sub S. In fact, it's really the G fiber bundle over G mod H with fiber N sub S. And uh, it's not really true that they're equal or isomorphic, there's somehow a, a tall mapping connecting the two. But a tall, a tall mappings um, preserve these four conditions. So it turns out that if N satisfies P at X, then N sub S satisfies P at zero and vice versa. So that allows us to localize the problem of showing that N has rational singularities by looking at all these uh, symplectic slice representations. Uh, I have a question. Is it yeah. actually, uh, actually N sub S or is N sub S times some linear factor that you ignore? No, because N sub S, no, there's no factor which we ignore. But of course, S might have lots of H fixed points, which are a factor you might want to ignore. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm kind of confused what happens with E star. So can you have E and you have S and E star kind died? It, e, the point is N, if you look at dimensions, it adds up. The dimension of NS is the dimension of N minus the dimension of G plus the dimension of H plus the dimension of NS. There's no, there's no extra fat. It's because it's not an ordinary slice because you're taking a slice in this symplectic thing n. So it's not the ordinary Luna slice. You have to show, throw away an extra factor. Usually in a slice, you throw away the factor e. But since we're in a symplectic setting, you have to throw away e star as well. Okay, e star would not give any contribution to the no. to n, no. yes? No, no, no. It doesn't, okay. 
Now, what becomes important in our game is the null cone NCV of a G module V, which is defined to be the, in, the fiber uh, through zero, the fiber through the origin. So it's pi V inverse pi V of zero, where pi V is the quotient mapping. Another definition of the null cone is you take all vectors in capital V such that the closure of the orbit contains zero. That's another definition of the null cone. And similar, we have a null clone in the shell N to be, well, just the fiber over zero, uh, through zero. And what becomes important Hold on. What becomes important for us is this number lambda v. It's the maximum of the dimension of a linear subspace in the null cone. Now the null cone can have pretty high dimension, can have low co-dimension in v, but that's not what we're interested. We're interested in the linear subspaces of the null cone. And it turns out that this number lambda v, the maximum dimension of a linear subspace of the null cone, it's the same for V star. <clears throat> so now we can define our condition for showing that the shell N is good. So let S be uh, a symplectic slice representation of N. And now we're gonna throw away the stuff that's just a vector space. So let W0 denote the H stable complement to the fixed point, the H fixed points in W. So this is where something is actually happening. And then we make the following definition. So we take a symplectic slice representation of N and W0 uh, as above. Then we say that the symplectic slice representation is good if one of the following holds up to changing the Lagrangian subspace. In other words, up to changing W0. We don't change W upper H, that doesn't really do anything. So the first condition is not very exciting. It says, first condition would be, well, if H0 is a torus, then we want W0 to have FPIG, which of course means that N sub S is good, as we saw from the theorem. It's the second condition that's somehow interesting. It's the lambda of W0 is less than dim W0 minus dim H. So the maximum dimension of a linear subspace in the null cone is less than the dimension of W0 minus dimension of H. Okay. So is it important here that S is a slice, you, you can't just yeah. no, um, can say it uh, in ambient. Yeah, I could say, I could, of course, I could say that the slice representation V plus V star with respect to G is good. It also has to be good. So all the slice representations includes the original representation V plus V star. Mm -hmm. That's a, a symplectic slice representation. Maybe I'm not answering yes. your question. Uh, just, just, you have here some criterion for, for shell to be good, yes? Yeah. So it's, well, in fact, it'll be a general shell. I, I haven't oh, listed no. the theorem yet. I'll, I'll list the theorem and then, and then uh, maybe. Ah, ah, this is a definition. It's not a theorem. It's a definition. It's a definition. I'm telling you when a slice, symplectic slice representation is good. But I haven't told you that it has anything to do with N being good, with the mm. respect to the shell being good. Mm. But here's a preliminary proposition. If all the symplectic slice representations of N are good, then N is normal with finite principal isotropy groups. So this is a, I won't give the proof of this, it's just hacking. There's nothing too interesting about that. You just have to prove, of course, that N is a variety, a complete intersection, and the, and the uh, singularities are in co-dimension two. 
right? I mean, that's all you need to prove. So th this is kind of banal. But the main theorem is a little more exciting. It says, suppose that every symplectic slice representation of N is good, then N is good, i.e. has rational singularities and finite principal isotropic groups. Moreover, in this case, the categorical quotient has symplectic singularities, which I won't define, but that's what we worried about in our previous paper was when N mod G had symplectic singularities. And this is another theorem giving you many cases where the uh, categorical quotient of the shell has symplectic singularities. So this is the main theorem. <clears throat> but then of course, there's one other thing, of course, when are all the slice representations good? But main theorem says, if they are, then you're happy. So we use a criterion of Mastada. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, for rational singularities. Nero Buder in his paper used it and he used quiver techniques uh, to prove uh, the P equals two condition for groups of type A. But of course we can't use quiver techniques because that's limited to type A. So we had to do something else, which uh, is this business with the lambda of V uh, condition. So here I have to, the criterion of Mastata has to do with jet schemes of a scheme. Jet schemes, well, of a variety in this case. So I'm gonna give you the definition for N and not the general definition because it's kind of complicated. So in our case, the, the equation, so we take M plus one tuples in V and M plus one tuples in V star. And then the empt jet scheme N sub M of N is given by the following equations where A runs through a basis of the Lie algebra. If you look at the first equation, the first equation is just the equation for N itself, right? You take a vector in V and a vector in V star and you have the condition that C A X equals zero for all A in the Lie algebra. And that's, that's the definition of N. If you add the second equation, then you're looking, the second equation, the first two equations give you the union of the Zariski tangent spaces of N. So that's the first jet scheme. It's the tangent space in some sense. And then when you go all the way to M, you get somehow the M jets. So N, it gives you the space of all M jets of N. So that's the jet scheme. And the theorem, well, first we have a projection. So if you look at all these equations, of course, uh, if you look at the vector satisfying equations, of course, X zero and C zero satisfy the first equation. So we have a projection rho M from the jet scheme back to the original variety N. So rho M is the projection. And then there's this fantastic theorem of Mastada from 2001, which says the following, let N be a, so it's no longer just a shell. So let N be a local complete intersection variety. This is characteristic zero. The following are equivalent for M greater than or equal to one. And each implies that the dimension of the jet scheme is just M plus one times the dimension of N. That's the expected dimension. That, that would be the dimension of N were smooth. So the equivalent conditions are that N sub M is irreducible. And the second equivalent condition is that the inverse image of the singularities has dimension less than M plus one dim N. So those two conditions are equivalent. And moreover, if these conditions hold, one of them holds for all M, then N has rational singularities. So it's a very geometric condition for rational singularities, which doesn't mention resolution of singularities, which is the usual definition. So, but of course it only works for locally complete intersection varieties, but happily shells are 
uh, complete intersection. Those shapes, not, not shapes in general, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not shapes in general, but just in the cases, in these cases, yes. For any com locally complete intersection variety, yeah. in particular for a shell, which is uh, a variety, because a, a mm -hmm. a sh if a shell's variety, it is a, it is a complete intersection by, um, well, let's just say yeah, no. he is one modular. Then yeah, okay. And it's a complete yes. intersection. Right. Okay, so yes. So before we can apply Mastata, we have to know that N is a locally complete, it, it, it is a complete intersection. But we saw if all the slices are good, N is normal in a complete intersection. It's normal and then it's a complete intersection. So we can apply Mastata if we can prove all these conditions hold. So we know that N is a variety with FPIG and we, I forgot to say, of course, it's a complete intersection because we assume, we, is, we prove that it's one module, that V is one module. So N is a complete intersection. And the proof of the theorem is very easy except for the last step. Namely, if we look at a symplectic slice representation, which is good, all of its slice representations are good. And the, the group we're talking about, the H, is a proper subgroup of G. So you can assume by dimension, by in, induction over dimension and number of irreducible components, that the theorem is true for any proper subgroup of G. So using the slice theorem, we find that N minus the null cone has rational singularities. You get this by free by induction and the symplectic slice theorem. Okay, so, okay. So now we have to worry about the original representation, V plus V star with respect to G, but this is assumed to be good. So in order to keep the notation from being crazy, let's assume there are no fixed points. That obviously doesn't change whether N is, is good or not. If condition G1 holds, namely G0 is a torus, and by changing V to another Lagrangian subspace, V has FPIG, then of course N is good already from the, from the old theorem. So in other words, if, if G was a torus to begin with, we're done. So that's not interesting. The other case is when lambda of V is less than dim V minus dim G, then the fun begins. So what we show is that the inverse image of the null cone is, is not dense in any irreducible component of N sub M, okay, from that condition. Well then, N sub M is the closure of the inverse image of N minus NCN. I mean, the, 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 the complement of the null cone. Because the inverse image of the null cone is not dense in any irreducible component. So and everything has to be the closure of the inverse image of the complement of the null cone. But of course, this inverse image is irreducible because N minus NCN is, um, uh, has rational singularities. So N sub M is irreducible and has rational singularities and we're done. So uh, I have to convince you that of this uh, statement here, that the inverse image of the null cone is not dense in any irreducible component. Okay, so fix X in M plus one tuples. And let RJ be the rank of the dim G equations EJ on V star M plus one. Of course, the Jth equation only involves the first J plus one copies of V star. And of course, of course the rank is at most dim G. So let Y be the solutions of the equations with our fixed X. In other words, we're taking N and we're looking at all the points where with a fixed X, vector X. 
And all those points is a vector space because the equations, if you fix X, the equations are linear in uh, the dual variables C. So Y is linear of dimension well, if there were no equations, it would be m plus one dim v star, but then you have to subtract the rank of the various equations ej. So v is linear of this dimension. So the lemma is the projection, which takes an m plus one tuple in v star and maps it to the first entry, maps y onto a linear subspace F sub M in V star, of course it's a linear projection of dimension dim V star minus RM. So the vector space has dimension dim V star minus RM, which is at least dim V star minus dim G. Okay, now let's assume that uh, we have lambda V star less than dim V minus dim G then the dimension of this linear space F sub M is greater than lambda of V star, so that F M is not contained in the null cone. Because there's no linear space in the null cone of that big a dimension. Notice the null cone may have bigger dimension than F M, but it will not contain a linear subspace of dimension of the dimension of F M. So, that's the key trick. So if I have a point in N and the second component is not in the null cone of V star, then a whole, then that means that the G orbit of C zero does not contain zero in its closure. Then obviously the orbit of X zero C zero does not contain, the, the orbit of this point does not contain zero in its closure. So if C0 is not in the null cone, then the whole point X0, C0 is not. Hence, the inverse image of the null cone intersected with this linear subspace X cross Y inside N sub M, it's not dense in X cross Y because its projection uh, is not onto this linear subspace that Y maps onto. And since X is arbitrary, the inverse image of the null cone is not dense in any irreducible component of N sub M. So we're done. As long as all the slice representations are good. So that proves the main theorem. So the question is, when do we have lambda V less than dim V minus dim G? Well, we have to prove this because it's the key to the whole game. So it's not easy to determine lambda v in general. But we have the following proposition. Suppose that v is orthogonal. So it has a non-degenerate gene variant bilinear form. Then lambda v is precisely one half the dimension of v minus the dimension of the uh, vectors of uh, zero weight with respect to the maximal torus. And in that case, Lambda V is less than dim V minus dim G, if and only if the dimension of G is less than one half dim V plus the dimension of V upper T. This is just arithmetic from step one and uh, this inequality. Well, this is pretty good because for most representations of G, the dimension of V is a heck of a lot bigger than dim G. So for orthogonal representations, we're probably in good shape. Now, actually, this proposition occurred in the literature, and the only place I know it is when V is the Lie algebra of G itself. So if V is the Lie algebra of G, the statement is that lambda V, the biggest, uh, the dimension of a linear subspace of the null cone, is equal to the dimension of a maximal nilpotent subalgebra of G. That's one half dim V minus dim VT in this mm. And this theorem is due to Gerstenhaber for G equals SLN back in 1958. And for general simple G is only proved in 1998 to, by Mishulam and Rodwan. So it's a, this proposition is a direct generalization of classic, classical results for Lie algebras. 
And, and the joint representation is always orthogonal because of the yes. killing form? Correct, correct. And in fact, uh, yes, and in the case that we're interested, where you take P, the direct sum of P mm, copies okay. of the adjoint, of course, that's still orthogonal. I think we don't need to make change of Lagrangian in the case that we're interested in, yes? Uh, well, it's pretty easy to pick the obvious. It's obvious which one to pick. Yes, in some sense you don't, but let me, let, I just have one right. more slide, okay. So let G be a class, of, now here's something which is off the side. Let G be a classical group and be a direct sum of copies of the defining representation or its dual. So for example, copies of CN plus CN dual for SLN or copies of the standard representation of symplectic group. Now, these are not necessarily orthogonal. For example, in the second case, if P is odd, it's not orthogonal. So it's not exactly, we can't exactly use this proposition that we just showed. But in any case, by tricks and so on, we can prove the following. So for a representation as above, classical representation of a classical group, N is good if and only if it is a complete intersection variety, i.e. if and only if V is one modular. So it's saying that you don't need dim G modular as that general theorem was. For this special, very classical case, as soon as V is one module, N is perfectly wonderful. So back to the case at hand. So let G be simple, semi-simple doesn't, I mean, boils down to simple. And let V be P copies of the adjoint representation for P granular equal to two then the lemma says that any symplectic slice representation is good, which of course is what we need to prove the theorem. So as Rami sort of said, there's an obvious Lagrangian subspace, and this is it. W is P copies of the Lie algebra of H plus P minus one copies of the quotient G mod H. This is ah. an H module. And now we discuss the slices. It's not the same as the original representation, yes? It's, it's actually, W is actually the slice in V. It, it, it turns out in this, in the case of orthogonal, if you take the slice representation corresponding to H in V, then mm -hmm. that slice representation plus the dual is a symplectic slice. So this is the slice in V, but it's the W, the Lagrangian subspace. And then that W zero be the usual thing and T a maximal torus of H. So we have to prove that this uh, W plus W star H is good. Now, if H zero is a torus, then W contain, no, notice P is at least two, all right? So W- Who is contain, H zero? Huh? Who is H zero? H zero is the identity component. Of H. Uh, uh, H is also totally connected, yes. Yes, correct. So if H0 is a torus, some torus, then W contains a copy, P minus one is at least one, so it contains G mod H, so it contains a copy of G mod T. Well, the worst case would be if T is the maximal torus of the group G. So this would be the space of all roots. But the maximal torus acting on the space of roots has finite principal isotropic groups. You have positive roots and negative roots and everything's fine. So it's good. So again, the torus case is easy. If H naught is not a torus, then we have to show, then you show this inequality, hence SH is good. So let's just, it, it requires a little hacking around, but let's suppose Let's suppose H is semi-simple. Then I claim it's trivial. If H is semi-simple, then W0 is, contains uh, P copies of H, right? There's no, H is semi-simple, H has no fixed point. So it's just, so we have, we need dim H less than one half P times dim H. Well, if P is bigger than two, it's trivial. So in this whole game, P is bigger than three is easy. The hard case is P equals two. So you have to do a lot of arguing <clears throat> to show that it's good, but in fact, it's true. 
Okay, so the final theorem is what you can imagine. The let G be semi-simple and V P copies of the adjoint representation for P grand equal to two, then the shell is good. And <clears throat> interesting question, when is N factorial or when is V two modular? Well, this is if and only if P is bigger than two, which is the easy case, or G contains no simple factor of rank one. So the problem is when G contains an SL2 or an SO3. But if that doesn't happen, then N is factorial. And of course the quotient by G, which is semi-simple, so connected, has trivial character, right? Trivial character. So N mod G is also factorial. Why is fact, SL3 the problem? Hmm? Why is SL3 the problem? It is SL2. so fun. SO3. SO3. Sorry. It's rank one, rank one. And in this case, the singularities of N are in codimension at least four in the second case, which is important for some other applications that I won't mention. But, oop, I'm too, I'm sorry. I'm finished. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I think I have a question. Yeah. So yeah, maybe if I have some remarks that this is basically the best possible result of this kind because if P is equal to one, then it's, it, it just will not be two. Uh, I, I know if P is equal to one, then it just will not be two because it's it will not be complete intersection. So it is, it will yeah, not... yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, nobody knows what to do when P equals one. I mean, but but uh, when you try, when you look at this analysis at P equal one, so you you can get some, um, so measures to how much it is not, uh, uh, it, like the, the dimension is, is not good enough, so, um, how, how much is it wrong? So can you like repeat the argument and see exactly um, how much? The problem is it's not a complete, it's not zero modular. Mm -hmm. It's not a complete intersection. I mean, you have a mapping, what, from G plus G star to G star and the Imrus image of zero is the commuting variety. So it's the commuting yes. variety problem. Which Over there, which is a four on dimension. Yeah. But still, still, you can do this um, cal calculation of the jet, uh, the jet, jet schemes, and uh, how how long is it? Uh, how how much they are off? From I really haven't tried, but it's uh, uh, or, or the calculation of maximal commuting, uh, like ma maximal linear space in the important cone. How well, much is it off? This you could this you could certainly do. Well, that um, no, but it's it's no, but it's just the case of, of if it's if it p equals one, it's the classical thing from the Lie algebra case. The the, the, the lambda v is one half. It's it's the number of mm. uh, positive roots. So and how much is it off lambda from g, g? Is the Lie algebra lambda? It's lambda of g you're worried about, and it's just the number of uh, positive roots. So how much is it off from the thing that we want it to be in this case? Well, uh, you want uh, dimension of G less than one half dimension of G minus, D. I mean, it doesn't work at all. It would be ah. dimension of G is less than uh, one half the dimension of G. Mm -hmm. Approximately one half the dimension. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so it's, it's way off. Yeah. So, so we're off by a factor of two. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I, I mean, I everybody. It's a. Uh, it's, what is it? Uh, it? A lot of people have looked at this commuting variety, and mm -hmm. it's. Uh, it's uh, my, my hope is maybe somehow one can use this approach to attack uh, abscess of convergence, which are not integers. Okay, but that's maybe too much open-ended question. Um, uh, because that is the conjunction, like, uh, or like, 
for people to write it is wrong and for people to do it correct. So from point of view of algebraic geometry, the problem solved. But we know that in, the real number is something in between. So oh, the relational actually number. find the actual number rather than yes. estimate it? Yes, ah. maybe using this approach. Uh, but but, uh, but some variation. Approach, I mean, this approach only comes into the whole picture of abscissus convergence because of your theorem. And it only works for integer, I mean, it, uh, so the, the theorem work can be somehow been... modified. Oh, okay. On, for non integer. So maybe, okay, so maybe okay. this is too, too open ended question. Sorry. No, that, yeah. Maybe, you maybe have... you can ask, like, ah, oh, sorry. I mean, if, if Rami, if I want to extend Rami's remark, maybe is there like a bound on the uh, rate of growth of dimension of the jets, of those NM, but for, for mm. equals one? Oh, uh, this I don't know. Um, this will tell you the local threshold. The trouble is, of course, you can't use anything from Mostada because he requires it to be a variety. And nobody knows if the commuting variety is reduced. I, don't, I, don't I think think it's, this uh, is proven recently. I think this is proven. Very, it's I been proven so. several times. Is it really proven recently? Ah, uh, this I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't think you need reduce like reducedness, like for reduced. That's what you. Well, but, but, just, but just to compute the dimension of jet schemes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Can you can use your technique in order to compute yeah, the yeah. dimension? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, what, if the jet scheme is defined by quadratic equations of the kind, if it's defined by those equations, then the jet scheme is defined by the equations I wrote mm -hmm. down. That's completely fruitful. yes, it is. Uh, uh, and so you can use the, the same technique and to to compute exactly the dimension of jet schemes. Yes. Or any bound. Uh, well, you you have to compute what the equations give you, and. I, I mean, the, the theorem of Mastata works if the dimension of the jet schemes is correct and they're irreducible. But the, I mean, if you write down the equations, of course, you can compute the dimension. No, but the, the, yeah, so the, if the, the, the equations are the same, but in your, like in your case, you computed the dimension in terms of this lambda. Oh, you, you bound no, the dimension no, no, using we, lambda. We, we, well, what we had to prove is the inverse image of the null cone was nowhere dense in any irreducible component of the jet scheme, right? We had to prove that the inverse image of the null cone of the shell, N, was nowhere dense in any uh, irreducible component of mm -hmm. the mth jet scheme. So can you actually compute the dimension of this inverse inver image? Yeah, yeah, we could. Yeah, you can. I mean, once you write down the equation, you can compute its linear algebra more or less. Once in, in terms of lambda, yes. Uh, in terms of lambda v. Well, I don't think it's if and only. If we know if lambda mm. v is less than whatever, then the dimension, mm -hmm. then the then the inverse image is nowhere is not dense in any irreducible ah, component. So you can bound the dimension. Could, you would you would have to, you could do it, but you would have to do the following. You looked at, at the ranks of you know the jth equation had rank R J. I think the inverse image of a, a point in N would have to would have something to do with the ranks of these equations, R J. So you would have to stratis stratify n by the ranks of these equations, and then look, and then I think you could easily compute the inverse image of each of these strata, the dimension of that, and then you know take the maximum of whatever happens. But uh, the point is that the, these shells have very simple quadratic equations. You could compute all these jet schemes. Good. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.
Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so just one more announcement about um, next time. I think it's in two weeks. So let me just check it. Um, so it's in two weeks, but it's an earlier time. It's a 1 p.m. Israeli time, so it should be better for people from Far East, but probably not so good for people from America. But uh, <laughs> um, so next next time, next time the speaker is from Japan. So <laughs> so this the same day in two weeks, but uh, earlier time 1 p.m. So everything is on the calendar on the website. Okay. Okay. You. So Bye. see you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Chris. And thank you very much again for coming here. Very beautiful film. <laughs> very beautiful thank talk. You. <laughs> thank you. Bye.